Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and peace be upon you all and welcome to our second MKA UK podcast and today we're going to be discussing the Harika Jadid, the new world order. It sounds pretty scary, what is it? We're going to be looking at this and looking at the history of how this was actually founded. We're going to look at a time where a group called Majlis Ahrar actually stood up and they claimed that they would not rest until they had wiped out the Jamaat, of course, Ahmadiyyat, from the face of the earth. Now, the leader of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community at that time, the Caliph, Hazrat Muslim Maud, he replied to them by saying that I see the earth slipping from under the feet of the Ahrar. They say they will wipe out this Jamaat, but Allah Almighty has told me of a plan with which the Jamaat will spread in all countries of the world and no one will be able to destroy it. Now, the question is, from this moment in the past to now in the present, where we see the Ahmadiyya Muslim community truly spread across the world and is a positive fighting force for, for the world, how did it not only survive this threat, but actually thrive and become such a productive organization, benefiting tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people around the world? We're going to be going on this journey to figure this out. But before we do, we do have, of course, our guests who will be speaking to you today. Uh, we have Raza Ahmed Saab, who is a missionary of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community. And later on, we will have Nasser Ahmed, who is overseeing the Hariki Jadid from the uh, Amya Muslim Youth Association perspective as well. Now, of course, we do hear about the Hariki Jadid a lot. People kind of assume, uh, Raza Saab, that it is actually just a chanda. It's actually just a charitable act. A lot of people actually wonder, is this not actually an innovation? The Holy Prophet Muhammad said that really only sadaqah and zakat are mentioned in the Holy Quran. These are the only two obligatory ways that we should spend in the way of God. Then what is this new innovation? We also have other types of chandas in the jamaat. Are these all not what we would hit class as a bidah? So I'll turn to you for this uh, straight off the, the front of it. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Zakallah, first of all, for having me. Um, yeah, that's that's actually a good point. But it's uh, the simple answer to that is it's it's no. If you look at the lifetime of the Holy Prophet, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. Um, whenever the Holy Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was in need of uh, financial contributions, if they wanted to go on an expedition, if they had anything else to do, then he would call the Sahaba. He would say to them that come and spend in the way of Allah. And we know the famous example of Hazrat Abu Bakr Siddiq radiallahu anhu and Hazrat Umar radiallahu anhu, where they would vie with each other who would bring the most. So, as a Muslim who has also said about the Hariqa Jadid, though it is not uh, one of the, it's not compulsory uh, for you to, to, to pay the chanda, but if you know about it and if you don't uh, pay and if you don't contribute, it's not about having millions and millions of pounds contributing to the scheme, it's just about taking part of the blessings, uh, being part of this blessed scheme. So if you don't um, take part in this, uh, although the Khalifa of the time, first of all, has said it, then you might not be held accountable in this world. But in the next world, as Muslim Muslim Ma'ud has said, you will certainly be asked about that. So no, it's not an innovation. And look, to run the day-to-day -day things of an organization, you cannot do that without money these days. If you are part of a club, you have to pay membership. If you are part, uh, if you're driving a car, you have to pay insurance. So these are the things to to which are used to run the daily um, things of a, of an organization. I, I mean, I understand you're trying to say that th these are of course not compulsory funds. Um, but my question really is that: uh, Do how these at the same time are they also paying the, uh, like are they also paying sadaqah? Are they also paying zakat? Or are these things? kind of put to the side and is, is more emphasis sometimes put on these things. Is that the I'll, case? I'll tell you, I'll tell you one very interesting fact. If you look at the receipt uh, that uh, is issued by the Jamaat to the members of the community, if they pay chanda, at the top, at the top, it's not chanda arm, it's not wasiyat, at the top, it's zakat and that's where we start off with. Look, you cannot neglect that, uh, I mean, the Jamaat is not introducing anything new. The rules of Islam, the Sharia, they fully and completely abide, um, uh, are, are abided by in, in, the, in the... I think it's quite clear. You, you're, you're trying to say that, of course, the obligatory, obligatory uh, charitable acts like Sadaqah and Zakah, they are also very important. Ahmadis also do that. Uh, but you're also arguing that it's proven from the history, from history and the acts of the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam that spending in other charitable ways, whether it's building mosques, whether it's helping people, whether it's helping the cause of Islam, that's allowed, and you're not allowed. You're allowed to do that. That's not an innovation. But can you actually prove 
that these funds which are collected by by the Ahmadiyya community from from their members are actually being used for purposes which are justified or are they being funneled away for you know questionable things the policy of the jamaat is transparency of every member of the community whether from 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 any country from any walks of life whatever society country nation you belong to you have the right to find out where your money is going and look if when it comes to tahrik al jadid it's not being used to buy flashy cars it's not being used to to buy material things for members of the community or even khalifa vak no it's for our benefit if you go to any country in the world you will find a masjid you will find a mission house you can go to that mission house you can go to that masjid and pray and even stay maybe maybe even the night and that is done for us for the members of the community nobody is having any personal gain from the chanda that we pay to the jamaat Mm-hmm. Okay, so I mean, you're you're basically saying that none of these funds are obviously used for the personal expenses of the organizers, the administrators, uh, but you're saying that rather these funds are used for, for humanitarian projects, other construction projects. Do you, do you have any really figures to actually prove uh, this point? Uh, every time, every year, at Jalsa Salana, Hazur Anwar Eid Allah Taala Abnas Aziz, he announces what is the Jamaat doing. For example, uh, when it comes to the progress of the Jamaat in 2020, we have distributed 9.3 million leaflets. Again, propagating the message of Islam. We have built 217 new mosques across four country, four continents, 124 newly built and 93 existing mosques. Again, these are not. mansions that are bought for for individuals you have 97 new mission houses you have 360,000 plus books that have been printed um um for the propagation of Islam and you have saved 5.2 million dollars by volunteering and these are the members of the jamaat which is also one aspect of the hadith al-jadid I mean, and beyond this, I'm, I'm sure that we all actually know. Oh, this is just the beginning of the list. Yeah, there's like there's hospitals, there's schools, and and the list, like you said, is endless. We could talk about this, and I think it's quite clear that, of, of course, these are the things which the, the charitable donations are used for. But we know that the Hadith Jadid is not just a charitable donation; it's rather actually it's actually a way of life. There's much more history to the Hadith Jadid than just being a chanda. So, really, the, my next question is that we can see. that in the present day the dikh jadid has taken on the form of something which is positively contributing to society it's, it's whether it's humanitarian whether it's spiritual but where did this all begin and what were the things which made people actually want to go and do these things so as you mentioned in 1934 hazur uh, aktas az muslim aur razila taala anho which was in november uh, 23rd 1934 the majlis e hirar you had a you had a community you had an organization that was out to uh, not just verbally but now the time came that physically ahmadis were being targeted targeted so it wasn't just merely opposition and saying oh you're wrong you're kafir you're this or that no they physically wanted to wipe out the wipe out the jamaat and for me personally when i found out about this and when i read more about the demands that hazrat muslim aur razila taala ne made from the community or wanted the community to adopt it's surprising that out of these 19 demands i'm not sure how, what would you guess i mean when i asked a lot of people in in my jamaats or in different uh, forums when you think of tehreek al jadid what's the first thing you think of the first thing automatically people think about oh chanda probably you know financial contribution but out of the 19 only one of them just one of them talks about financial contribution the rest the remaining 18 they talk about what we have to do what we have to change within ourselves how should we behave where should be where should we be morally where should we be spiritually where should we be when it comes to the relationship that we have with our fellow human beings with the members of the jamaat as well as non members of the jamaat okay That's really interesting. So you've got various demands that actually maybe are not commonly heard of: leading simple lives, you know, dedicating yourself to the service of Islam, uh, you know, offering uh, children for dedication as well, and even things like keeping the roads and and your city and your environment clean. These are yeah. demands that you could lead, and obviously these yeah. are things which are much greater and, and form a larger part of a conduct, a code of conduct of, of life. So these are, of course, the demands. These are the ways that. uh the ahmadiyya muslim community was asked to step up in light of the threat of majlis sehrar and other organizations so we had this threat where supposedly the opponents of islam of, of ahmadiyya wanted to dis- destroy ahmadiyya 
And the solution to this threat by the Muslim world, which was given, was these demands to step up. But my question is, uh, how did then the Ahmadiyya Muslim community step up? How did they actually use these demands to actually make Islam successful? And how are we able to see the Jamaat standing on its own two feet today? So we're actually going to turn to, um, you know, Nasr Sahib now as well, Nasr uh, Bharti Sahib, who here is here for, from the AMIA uh, Association, is overseeing Tariq Shadid as a national executive. Assalamu alaikum uh, Are you here with us? Ji, assalamu alaikum Thanks well, for having Islam. me. Zakallah. So my question really to you is, like I said, we have seen that the Ahmadi Muslim community was under threat. How did it go from being a threatened uh, a Jamaat, a, a, a community that was, a, a, you know, had its existence in question, it went from there to a community which has not only now survived but has become so successful. What was the key ingredient in, in having yeah. a key there? Yeah, so we have you know, several uh, examples of uh, how Jamaat members came forward in the early days. So, for example, um, in 1936, you know, just a couple of years after the launch of Tariq al-Jadid, uh, 1,300 members of the Jamaat committed to do voluntary work during okay. holidays. And uh, similarly, uh, another 200 young members dedicated their lives for the service of the Jamaat for three years. Mm-hmm. However, I just want to mention one really faith inspiring incident. Okay. And this is again, you know, from, from the early years. And it's related to one of the initial urgent instructions of Tariq al Jadid, where, you know, Hazrat Muslim and who asked for men who are prepared to leave their own countries for the needs of the, for the, needs of the Jamaat right. to come forward. Mm. And uh, so, upon a hearing of this and the scheme in general, um, one young man left his home of Sargoda and decided to go to Afghanistan. And he went without a passport and started doing tablik there. Right. So sooner rather than later, the government um, found out about him and actually arrested him and imprisoned him. He went into jail. Okay. So, however, that didn't deter him. He was in jail and he started preaching the guards and the inmates of the prison. <laughs> All right. And in turn, you know, it started actually influencing them. So the, issue, the situation got really sort of escalated and the prison officers decided to, you know, officially file a complaint against him. The mullahs also issued a fatwa for his death um, because, you know, in those days, the death penalty was was around. Um, so the situation escalated and he went in front of the commanding minister. But I mean, and here we see the, you know, the, the miracle of Allah Ta'ala that the commanding minister said that he's actually a subject, this member of the Jamaat, he's a subject of the British Empire. Remember, India at this time was under British rule, mm. so he could not be killed. He had to be sent back to India safely, and that too, under the protection of the Afghani government. Okay. So it's such an amazing incident. So there's a, it, it goes on to, uh, to state that when this young member went back to India, to Qadian, he met Hazur, and Hazur actually said to him that, you should have gone to a different country. And his reply immediately was that, please tell me which country and I will go this very instant. So, you know, okay. it's such a faith inspiring instant that he's forgotten all the, the ordeal that he's gone through. You know, firstly, it would have taken him weeks to get to Afghanistan. He got imprisoned. He went through that whole lot of the anxiety, that you know, fear right. factor. And um, we see the miracle of how he's able to get back. And then he was still ready to go anywhere he was instructed so, to do so. so. kind of what you're saying is that the way that the Ahmadi Muslim community survived these threats was literally the very members of the community gave up everything that they had. They gave up their time, their wealth, you know, their lives, literally. And they went out and they preached what the true message of their, their community was, what Ahmadi had really stood for. And that, in essence, won the hearts of the people. And I think that's what has been shown in the past, that these people who made their sacrifices went out there, they really illustrated what Ahmadiyyat really stands for through their own character, through their own sacrifices. That if obviously evidently has won the hearts of the people. And those people who have now seen the truth, they cannot you know, see or believe anything wrong about the Jamaat anymore. And that's exactly what these people have done. So really, that's what they have done in the past. These are the sacrifices that they have Absolutely. made um, by following these 19 demands, whether it's leading simple lives, whether it's propagating the message of Islam, whether it's donating, whether it's many other ways, how can we, in this day and age, especially since this is an MKA podcast, how can the members of AMIA, MKA, Majlis Khudam al actually, in a similar way, step up in this day and age and try to propagate further uh, this message, this mission? Yeah, so how Khudam al is related to the is that, first of all, you know, um, 
there's some key instructions that Hazrat Muslim or the Rizal Talan who gave directly to Qudam Lemdia. Right. Um, but before that, I just want to mention in February 1953, Tariq Jadid was introduced to the departments of Qudam Lemdia for the first time. Okay. And then from then on, Tariq Jadid actually became formally part of the constitution. But as I mentioned, you know, there were some um, you know, instructions and there were some addresses that Hazur gave which talked about Qudam Lemdia and Tariq Jadid. So, for example, in November 30, 1938, just four years into the scheme, Hazur said that Majlis Qudam Lemdia is the army of Tariq Jadid. Okay? Okay. And he hoped that you know, many people would join this army and understand their responsibility. So, you know, understand the 19 demands, understand how Hazur wanted um, uh, us as Jamaat members to live our lives. And then uh, in another uh, address in 1950, Hazur really set out the expectations quite clearly and in fact took a pledge from Qudam Lemdia. This address was to Qudam Lemdia directly. It was a Qudam Lemdia event. And Hazur said that the pledge I want you to take is that if there's any Ahmadi in your village or town who is not taking part in Tehrik Jadid, you should try to make him part of it until there should not remain a single Ahmadi who does not take part in Tariq Jadid. Okay. So it's interesting that the above is not just for you know, office bearers or Qaideen or Amla members. This instruction was for every member of Qudam Lemdia. That our, it's our responsibility to promote the scheme and ensure that every member of the Jamaat is uh, part of this scheme and um, receives the blessings that are associated with the scheme. Absolutely. So this is really a huge responsibility for all of the members of MKA to really step up, understand the responsibility. We're going to really end off with that note. And I think it's food for thought for everybody listening as to what we now need to do in our personal capacity to try and carry on this great uh, mission. And of course, this uh, project, the Harika Deed, we know is actually called the New World Order. Many of you might be thinking the New World Order sounds pretty scary. It sounds something similar to what we might have seen in the past, like other revivalist movements, which were also prevalent at the time of Tariq Yadid, like communism and Marxism. We do not need to draw a comparison to them, whereas they were political uh, movements with political objectives, where Tariq Yadid, the New World Order, is not about a change within the political system in, in effect. It's rather a change within our spirituality, a change which we first bring in about within ourselves, and that automatically illuminates other people as well. We have seen, and you can also, after this, go and check out the 19 demands, and you will so yourself see that these demands are in no way political. Rather, they are those which demand a change within our own character and in the way we conduct our lives. Having said that, I hope you enjoyed today's podcast, and we will, inshallah, of course, be releasing one podcast every single month on various important topics relevant to our youth. Until then, stay safe, stay home. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, and peace be upon you all.